Would you like to learn about FinOps from the perspective of a cloud architect or an enterprise architect? If so, this video is for you. My name is Mike Gibbs. I'm an enterprise architect with a little over 25 years experience. And today's video, we're going to talk about FinOps for cloud architects, for cloud solutions architects, and for enterprise architects. Now, obviously, FinOps is not architecture. Architecture is more about uh, optimization of the business, aligning the organization's people, its processes, its technology, and in today's world, it's AI. That's more architecture to create a competitive advantage. But for us architects, we still want to deliver the best return on investment possible. And if we can cut the cost, then we can greatly increase our return on investment for what we're delivering for our clients. So this is a big thing. And cost optimization is always a good thing. So there's a lot of lessons we cloud architects can actually learn, we enterprise architects can learn from thin ups, and how we can integrate those principles to lower the cost of our actual cloud architectures. So we're going to talk about some FinOps principles we can bake into our cloud architectures, and then we'll provide some specific guidance on cost optimization and things that we could do, say, on the compute side, on the storage side, on the networking side, potentially on the availability side, on the data side, and definitely in the AI workload side. So if we're going to look about architecture and we're going to look at FinOps, uh, they do have one thing in common. It's all business first. So. Let's start with that principle. Every architecture choice should tie back to some uh, unit economics goal. And we need to know what is that say cost per customer or what is the cost for the transaction or whatever it is, business first. We do need to know what all these costs are. Now we have to assume cost becomes a non-functional requirement just like everything else. And we need to think about cost to serve. What does it cost to serve? And that includes everything we're dealing with, including the availability things we need to deal with, the security things we need to deal with, and every other component. Now, one principle we can take is we can add some guardrails and we can make sure that everything is allocated and, and, and cost is explained. And I'll explain what I mean by this. So we can make sure that every resource on the system has to be tagged, has to be labeled, maybe with an owner or a cost center or a data class or something. And if the resource isn't tagged, don't even allow it to be deployed in the first place. And by doing that, we can control the shadow things that show up that we end up, may end up paying for it that we shouldn't be paying for, which could also not only increase our cost, but weaken our security posture. So with FinOps, we want to design for the business needs. Same thing with architecture, but we also want to design for utilization. So in the cloud, one of the main benefits in the cloud is we can shrink the cost as the utilization goes down and the cost obviously expands when the utilization goes up. So if we do this right, if our architectures are correctly, if the business is experiencing a small slowdown, their technology spending should also slow down at the same time, assuming uh, the technology's utilization is going down. And... Uh, FinOps, you can think of as a loop, just like any other architecture, where basically, basically you have an idea, you notice something, you inform people, and then you optimize it, and then you check it again. So it's a constant loop. So let's talk about some architecture patterns we can actually bake into the design, some into our cloud architecture. So we should put a cost model into uh, all of our architectural decision records. And in this manner, you know, for every big decision, we, we, actually, we obviously know the results and the performance, reliability and risk, but we get the cost too. So we understand what it cost us from a business perspective to deliver whatever services we needed to. Now with the cloud, one of the things you want to do is right size by design. Now what does that mean? It means we want to architect for 95% of the organization's needs, not the statistical outliers. So we opt for say 95% and we can auto scale out the rest. And that can make a massive difference in a business's cost because we have organizations that typically may have quiet periods and then have extreme periods where they need a lot of technology, especially global retailers. And this way we can architect for what we need 95% of the time and add capacity on demand. So let's talk about what we can do on the compute side. Well, we obviously have various pricing models that we can actually use on the cloud and we should take advantage of them. 
So if we know what our utilization is before we move to the cloud and we need to truly understand our capacity and do great capacity planning before we go to the cloud, if we want to be cost effective. But if we know what we have, we can reserve capacity and get a bigger discount. But we can also use different forms of compute that we might want to use as well. So we should think about that. If we've got batch jobs and they're less critical batch jobs, we may be able to use the equivalent of an AWS spot or instance or a Google preemptible instance and run those things where it is absolutely cheapest. And we can combine reserving some, using some unused capacity at a cheaper price and many other things that we can do, committed use discounts, what have you. So keep that in your mind. One of the things is we wanna optimize each pricing model that we use. Now, serverless with care. Serverless can be absolutely wonderful for bursty traffic. But if you have high, uh, steady, uh, steady traffic that's constantly running, serverless gets very expensive very fast. And at that point, once uh, your cost reaches a certain threshold, it'll probably be cheaper with virtual machines. And virtual machines will offer better performance anyway. So there'll be a point where serverless works and there'll be a places where serverless doesn't. And it's important to use serverless where it matters and not use it where it does not matter. Now, the thing is scheduling non-critical workload. A lot of batch work, a lot of ETL things can run in off hours, and that's where we want to target the cheap capacity pools like the AWS spot instances or a Google preemptible instance. Now, let's talk about storage uh, and how we cut, reduce storage here. We have to tier our storage by access to what we can use is what we actually need. Whether it's something like AWS where they have S3, the traditional object storage, and then their version of infrequent access, which is object storage, but you pay to actually get it with their long-term storage, something like Glacier, where you've got multiple options for your data and you can use it based upon your data access needs. Well, this is something we want to do in every cloud. We want to tier our data. And we're going to automate that lifecycle management through our system. So if we need data frequently for a period of time, keep it there where it's most expensive and we only need to access it sporadically, move it someplace cheaper and we probably don't need to access it again. And if we access it, we need a day, we can get, we can wait a day or so to get it. That is the absolute perfect time for something like that to use that type of a glacier or slow or, or, or one of the lower cost storages. Now, typically we wanna optimize the format of our data and uh, how the data might be searched. Sometimes we wanna compress it, for example. Sometimes we wanna partition data, reduce scan costs. So think about that. And we wanna delete ruthlessly. I mean, to be fair, uh, the data that we don't need and we will never use again, we don't need that. So we have to be thinking about what we're maintaining, where we're maintaining, and, and it doesn't make sense. And from a security perspective, keeping information that's no longer value to you uh, just enhances your exposure anyway. So we have to be smart about our data and storage life cycles. Now the network, this can get pretty expensive pretty fast. A lot of people don't count on it. So here we wanna think about things we can do. If we can put our compute close to the data, we're not gonna be paying a lot of data transfer fees. So think about not having them in different regions whenever possible or things like that, uh, because you don't wanna be paying an environment where you're spending a lot of money just, just sending your data across the network. Now, whenever we're going from uh, some part of the Amazon network, um, Amazon network or Google network or Microsoft network to their, to their same network. Whenever we're going to their internal systems, for example, we don't have to go out the internet and then back in the internet. We can get some kind of a private endpoint or create private pseudo wires across the environment and we typically want to use that. Now, usually we want to use a content delivery network and some caching, and that way we can minimize the amount of uh, cross-network traffic and cross-region chatter, that kind of thing, and that can typically lower cost, as well as reduce latency. And then we need to think about what we're using, these middle boxes, for example, like maybe a NAT gateway may be very expensive if you're paying too many transactions, and there's other ways you could work around it with, for example, say firewalls and other ways to the internet. And you have to think about what makes sense for your business. So that's all we're really talking about. Now, from a data and an analytics platform, when we use these systems that are pre-made, typically we're, there, we're, by, we're paid by cluster size, and we wanna start with small clusters and let them scale out as needed. 
And uh, typically when I do that, it, 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 to, to reduce costs. And typically when I have some form of a quota and budget per team, and that way, when, before people are in doing uh, large queries, we, uh, we want to make sure that there's a budget for it, and there's a job budget that's pre-approved for them to actually do their things ahead of time. Now, let's talk about resilience and bill shock. You know, does the organization need 99.999%? And, it be, and the reason is when we get to those levels of availability and the amount of processes, the amount of people, the amount of additional redundancy gets very expensive. And does the business need that? And if it's a hospital, it needs that. If it's a global bank that's actively trading, it needs that. But not every organization does. And there is a major cost difference between a 99.999 architecture and a 99.9 architecture. So we want to keep, we want to make sure that we're right sizing our resilience, what we're actually doing. Now let's talk about the AI and GPU type workloads. Now let's be fair. You probably should consider a private cloud or a private data center for heavy duty AI workloads. Cloud computing is typically much more expensive for very high performance, high throughput applications. And AI could be one of them, but not in every case. And you should obviously cost it and weigh that against the trade-offs, against the agility of the cloud and the things being there already. But the key is consider a private cloud. But also think about how we would do this in the public cloud. So we want to track utilization ruthlessly on any kind of expensive server that we're actually using. And an AI server with a bunch of GPUs is definitely expensive, especially when we have many of them. So we want to make sure that our servers are about 70 to 80% utilized for steady jobs. And that way we're not paying too much. Now, we really want to right size with precision. We want to know exactly what our DRAMs are, or I'm sorry, exactly what our technology is. Is it a CPU-based model? Is it a GPU-based model? Is it a heavy memory model, for example? Because a lot of these things are very heavy memory-wise, and we have to figure that out. And we need to think about, you know, does an organization need a heavy system, or can they get away with a fractional GPU? Or could they do scheduled training uh, when it's not utilized, but at the lowest cost possible using spot type instances to do those things? So the answer is these are the kind of things that we want to think about with AI. So in this video, we discussed what is FinOps. And obviously, we said that FinOps and architecture are not the same. But we cloud architects and enterprise architects and cloud solutions architects can sure take a lot of lessons from FinOps to reduce the cost of our architectures, which obviously enhances our ROI. And we talked about ways and best practices to reduce costs in our cloud architecture. Now, if you'd like to become a cloud architect or a solutions architect or an enterprise architect, an AI architect or a security architect, I run two weekly webinars per week where I discuss architecture concepts, what we do as architects, the skills that you need as architects, how to get noticed as an architect, how to stand out, how to get your first architect job. And I do that on these free weekly webinars on Zoom. You can sign up. The link is in the description below. We'll do anything we can to help you uh, build your cloud architect or enterprise architect or security architect career on these free webinars. So free, free join and sign up. Uh, they're in the description of this video. Also, if you enjoyed this video or learned something from this video or liked the video, if you can give the video a like, subscribe to our channel, hit the bell to be notified of new things to help you in your cloud computing career, and maybe tell a friend so they can uh, see some of these free videos and they can be helped in their architecture career. This is Mike Gibbs signing off for now, and I look forward to seeing you in a new video. Take care.